Last Sunday, Pastor Dan began a series of messages on the Apostles' Creed entitled, We Believe. It matters what you believe. It's not just faith that's important, but faith in what? The people of Jesus' day formulated their core beliefs around the commands of God. To believe God meant to keep his commandments. The two were synonymous. There was a day when the religious leaders in Israel were surrounding Jesus, trying to trip him up, catch him saying something wrong. They posed two thorny questions to Jesus. The first was about paying the hated tax to Rome, and the second was a controversial theological question of the day, which was about whether there was a resurrection of the dead or not. Jesus amazed the people at his wise answers to these questions. You may want to read about them in Mark 12. Then they posed the next tricky question. Which is the most important commandment in the Bible? Turn with me to Mark 12, and we'll begin reading at verse 28 to see what Jesus said this time. I will be reading from the New Living Translation. The most important commandment. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The teacher of religious law replied, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Jesus quoted the core Jewish creed, Shema Yisrael. He confirmed the core declaration that there is only one God, but it was later when Jesus began to talk about his relationship with the Father that he got into major conflict with the religious leaders. Turn now to John 8, where we step into the middle of a very tense situation. They had been going back and forth with Jesus, and typical with the Middle East, words began to be thrown around. I'll start reading at verse 48. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. The people retorted, You Samaritan devil, didn't we say all along that you were possessed by a demon? No, Jesus said, I have no demon in me. For I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. And though I have no wish to glorify myself, God is going to glorify me. He is the true judge. I tell you the truth. Anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. The people said, Now we know you are possessed by a demon. Even Abraham and the prophets died. But you say, Anyone who obeys my teaching will never die? Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus answered, If I want glory for myself, it doesn't count. But it is my Father who will glorify me. You say he is our God, but you don't even know him. I know him. If I said otherwise, I would be as great a liar as you. But I do know him and obey him. Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. The people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you have seen Abraham? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. 
before Abraham was even born, I am. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him. Yes, angry words around beliefs turn into angry actions. It was Jesus' declaration that he and the Father were one that got him crucified. Yes, it really does matter what you believe. So how do you align Jesus' confirmation of the Shema Israel, the Lord our God is one, with his other statements about being one with the Father? Jesus declared that both were true. It is difficult to hold them together. Later in the service, Pastor Dan will talk about this. The word of the Lord. In fact, last week we began our, our series. And we talked about how understanding what we believe is actually very important. We call them a creed, which comes from that Latin word meaning, I believe. And the the issue of what we believe is very important. Today in our culture, it seems like there's this idea out there that it's, it's just having faith that's important. Not particularly important what you believe. It's just, you know, that's your belief and that's yours and that's your belief. Our idea today is believing is good. But what I want to tell you today is that it's more important what you believe in, actually, because it's what you believe that really defines what belief actually is all about. We saw how in Israel, they did have a core creed. This was their Shema Israel, which is the Hebrew word for hear, O Israel. And take a look at that. It says, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And this phrase is repeated by Jewish congregations every time they get together because ideas matter. In fact, sometimes ideas mean life and death, as we saw in our scripture reading this morning. Now, we saw last week how after the apostles died, ideas began to fly around about Jesus, some of them true, some of them not true. And it came to the point where the church realized, we better, we better define what we actually do believe. And so they gathered their people together, their leaders together, and they had a large debate, long debate about it, and they came up with what we call now the Apostles' Creed. This is what the apostles believe. And we have a, a bit of a summary decoration here on the stage with uh, these banners here, which kind of remind us about what this Apostles' Creed is about. And so I want to invite you to actually look in your bulletin and take out the Apostles' Creed that we printed in there. There's a card in there. And this is the creed that has been around for the church for over 2,000 years. This is a summary of the essentials of what we believe. Let's read this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So if someone asks you, well, what do you believe? This would be a very good summary to be able to explain to someone, this is the core of what it means to be a Christian. Now, as you read that, and as you look at that in your hand, perhaps there, you'll notice that there are actually four main themes that are in this core belief. And they have to do with the Father, the Son, the Spirit, 
and the church. Now, as you heard earlier in their service, Jewish Christians who had this creed had a theological challenge. How do you keep these ideas together? The creed of Israel, which they affirm every Sunday, every Sabbath, that the Lord is one and which Jesus affirmed and said, that is the most important thing about God. How do you keep that together with this fact that Jesus was introducing him talking to the Father and the Father talking to him and he's talking about the Holy Spirit? In fact, it was this relationship with the Father that got Jesus in trouble. And that was the core reason why they crucified him. Because, ladies and gentlemen, ideas matter. And it is a difficult concept to put the two together, but the fact that Jesus rose from the grave and came back and taught his disciples means we need to really listen to this Jesus and that the ideas he's bringing forth need to be seriously understood because who else, who else ever died, was buried and rose three days later and never died again. We must listen to this, this Jesus. He speaks with an authority like no one else. Well, we have a good example of how he explained to his people about this. And I want to point you to this story, the road to Emmaus. And uh, you remember the story is that Jesus had been crucified and buried. And there were two of the disciples that were just very saddened. They left Israel, left Jerusalem, I should say. And uh, on the way to Emmaus, they were joined by Jesus. But they didn't recognize him at first. And he said to them, how foolish you are, how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then when he broke bread at the meal, they realized who he was. We have in this story a very important principle about how we hold ideas together theologically. Jesus took them back and reread the scriptures of the Old Testament and showed them what they had not seen before. Now, this happens to us all the time. I wonder how many of you have had someone pass away in your family. And after that happened, you look back and you realize, you know, they were actually giving some hints that they kind of knew about this. And they said some things that at the time we didn't really twig to. But looking back now, they were kind of saying goodbye or maybe they were setting things together and getting it all ready. How many of you have had a, a story or a memory of something like that? Would you raise your hand? There's been a few of you. Yeah, especially when you have been very close to this person. And this is what we call the clarity of hindsight. In fact, those who are very good at writing novels, stories, they do this. People like Jane Austen and others who, would, who write these intricate stories, and when you read them through, they are so good they're worth reading again. And if you read a good story again, the second time through, you get way more out of it. You pick up little hints and little parts of the story that the first time through, you didn't notice. The second time through, because you've read the whole story, oh, I see that, and that, and that, and that's one of the markers of a very good novelist. Well, that, folks, is one of what we call the principles of hermeneutics. We call it re-reading. And so it is with the, the Bible. When you, when you study any document, actually, but let's just take the Bible for right now. When you read the Bible, when you start reading through Genesis through to the end, it's important that you actually read it all the way through, from Genesis through to Revelation. Because when you have read the whole story, 
then some of the individual pieces that were along the way make more sense. And when you have read the whole story once, when you go back and read it again, you will pick up another understanding that you may not have noticed first time through. And this is the principle of re-reading, of reading again. And this is the art and science of how we actually read the Bible. It captures the imagination and you see things that you did not see before. And so, when it comes to this question of the Trinity, the first time you read through the Bible, in the Old Testament especially, you may not have noticed some things. But when you read through to the end and you read Jesus' very clear teaching and then you read Paul's teaching and then you see the rest of the story, when you go back and look at the Old Testament again, you go, oh, now there was a little hint that we didn't notice the first time through. So I want to give you some re-readings of the Old Testament that are actually hinting to us and showing us that there is this three-personed God who was one. And I'm going to take you right back to the very first chapter of the book. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Notice the plural word there. The first hint that when God is speaking, Someone is actually listening. The first little hint. Now the second hint I'm going to point you to actually goes right to the Shema Israel. Take a look at this. Notice what it says there. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Three times the name of God is mentioned. It's a hint it's a hint that there's something about this God that has this threesome to it. And then I want to show you another really important scripture. This was the blessing that God told Aaron to say whenever the people come together, give them this blessing as they leave. And that is this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Three times. Now, you might say, well, maybe the three just means He's really emphasizing. And that's true. The first time through the Bible, and those who are living that First Testament would probably have thought that. When you give this blessing, we're saying, it's the Lord. It's our Lord that will keep you. We want our Lord to make His face shine and be gracious to you and give you His peace. It's our Lord that you must remember He is God and there is no other God in all of Israel and all of the world. And it would be true that repeating it three times would be emphasizing it. But that would be the first layer. When you reread with the New Testament, you see a hint that you didn't even notice the first time through. That there is something happening here. There is a pattern of three happening. And now I want to show you another really unique time in the Bible. There, from what I can recall, there's only two people who have ever seen the actual throne of God. The first one was Isaiah. And in that year, Uzziah died, and it describes this amazing throne and all the creatures around it. And there were four, these, these seraphim or these, these angelic beings were calling one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Those who were closest to the throne were stunned by this. Holy. Holy, holy. The other person who saw into the actual throne room of God was John. In the book of Revelation, he saw a very similar thing. He saw a throne, and there was one being on the throne. But the people that were around the throne were never day and night stopped saying, holy, 
holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So folks, when you reread the Bible with the full picture in mind, you see things that you hadn't seen before. And it was Jesus that began to really open this up to us. In fact, um, Jesus was teaching with his disciples, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he said in John 15, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You have seen him, because I'm talking to you. And Philip, he, ha- he along with everybody else actually, was having a hard time even beginning to grasp this new idea. And he said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough. And here's what Jesus responded. He said, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been with you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe? I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And the words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. Jesus was very explicit about this one. That the Father and Him were intimately connected. And to see Jesus meant you have seen the Father. Now Paul later, he got this. And in one of the letters that he wrote to the gathering in Colossae, he said, in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Now that, folks, that is a profound statement. All the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. That's, that is a profound thought. Now Jesus was trying to help his dis- disciples understand this, this plurality that's in the oneness of, of, the, of God, the Godhead. And there is another little time when he talks about this fellowship and this this connection. And I want to invite you to look at John chapter 15. And Jesus here said, when the helper, meaning the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Now, when you actually think hard about this, this is a very interconnected description. He's saying, I'm sending the Holy Spirit, and it's coming from the Father. That has implications. And the Spirit of truth proceeds from this Father, and He in turn testifies about me. Wow. This is one of those profound verses where Um, the disciples have to really think hard about this one. They didn't get it when he first said it. But Jesus, when he rose from the dead and he was ascending to heaven, he very specifically just laid it out plain as day. And it's in this great, great commission. The Lord came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, You go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. So what Jesus is saying is, when you make disciples, this is core. This is absolutely core to what we are to understand. And what we believe matters. And so this matter of the Trinity is no small thing. And so that's why 
decades later, when all the apostles had passed away, and they needed to gather together and make sure we keep the core thing, the core thing, and they made the Apostles' Creed, they specifically put that in there. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then they added the church. That's us. That's how it works for us. And so when they met and debated and discussed it, they concluded that both the Shema Israel, meaning God is one, and the Trinity, both were correct. Both were true. But they didn't have language for it. So they invented a new word. And the word was tri-unity, or three in unity. Shorten it down to trinity. And centuries later, the Irish actually came up with a little diagram. Because sometimes, sometimes a diagram can help us when words fail us a bit. So take a look at this diagram here. This is a famous diagram of the trinity. And you, what you'll notice when you first look at it is that there are three points to this. But look, look how they are interconnected. There's three points, but they all actually link. And there is one circle that intertwines with them all. Our Lord, our God, is one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit connected in ways that is hard for us to understand because we are so physically separate from everybody. But there is a different order of being in God. We are not God. And so it's difficult for us to totally comprehend what, what God is actually like because He's a different order of being. It's like trying to explain to a fish what a bird is. And so we come to God and we, we begin to get glimpses of this and we, we, we comprehend somewhat but we, we readily acknowledge we don't totally grasp it because God is greater than our understanding of this one. Now why is this so important, friends? Why are we taking time dealing into the deep theological things like this. Now the reason it's important is that this was the issue that was core for Jesus. In fact, he was willing to die for this concept. So why? Why would he die for an idea or for a belief that he knew would infuriate the Jewish leaders. Why? Friends, the answer is given to us in the most intimate piece of Scripture we have in the whole Bible. John was one of three who were invited by Jesus to come away from the rest of them and to be with Him when Jesus was praying to the Father. And it was the night before he was going to die for this idea. And when you are about to die for something, you're, you're, you're going to talk about what really matters. And so in John 17, we have the prayer, and I'm just going to show you this here. And he, Jesus said, my prayer, John wrote the prayer down, he was listening. My prayer is not for them only, meaning the 12 disciples. But I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That would be us. Because we've heard the disciples tell us. And here's what Jesus prayed for us. That all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Now here comes this core understanding again. That the Father is in Christ and Christ is in the Father. But he's inviting disciples to listen to this. He's inviting us to have a glimpse into what's going on with the Father. 
And then, he says, and may they also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. Friends, do we get the implications of this? Here is an intimate view right into the very nature of God himself, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit who live in this intimate connection. One essence, three persons, at the core of the universe, friends, is a loving relationship of mutual submission and of creativity and of joy. And Jesus said in his prayer, May they, meaning us, may they be in us as well. That, folks, is absolutely stunning. That in some way, we are invited into this intimate core of the universe that has been here ever since the very beginning. We don't become God. We are welcomed into the fellowship with God. And for that, you have to be made in His image. You have to have some way of actually being able to connect this way. And that's why in the creation, God put his image in us that is not in anything else in creation. Because it's only through the potential of being somewhat like God that we can actually even comprehend God, even see him. And then to be invited into fellowship with him? Folks, this is absolutely stunning. And that's why the Apostles' Creed, you'll notice on here, it ends with life everlasting. Friends, what you believe really matters. And this belief that has been given to us from the Apostles is really central and core. And this, friends, is why we believe in the Trinity and why we rejoice in this amazing revelation that Jesus brought to us. And so that's why we pray to Jesus, because when you pray to Him, you pray to God. That's why we say often at the ends of our prayers, in the name of Jesus, the one and only true God, Shema Israel, the name of Jesus Christ. And so we believe. And those who believe begin to experience some of this fellowship. And that fellowship comes when the Holy Spirit comes within us. And you begin to feel and sense love, joy, peace, patience. This is the nature of God starting to be reflected in us. A stunning transformation, folks. And this is what we call the gospel. Good news. And if there's anyone here who feels a drawing in their own heart to say, I would love to be in that. I want in. Jesus said, believe in me for eternal life. It is that simple. It's that important what you believe because what you believe opens the gate to eternal life. Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we believe. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving us your spirit. We believe, Father. And we enter by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's receive our benediction. You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we can call him Abba, Father. That is such good news. Yeah,